thanks a lot for this. It's more, uh, uh, it's more honor than I deserve because I'm uh, very uh, privileged to have a lot of good students doing uh, most of the work in these tools. So I'm not the only creator, for example, of the Hype compiler. I see at least one of them who has been in the Hype project uh, longer than I have been uh, sitting in the audience. Um, this is work that I've done also with two more students, uh, Krista Vrakakis and uh, Yanni Tsuris uh, at the National Technical University of Athens in Greece. And uh, this work and this talk would not have been possible if it hasn't been uh, their work mainly. So it's uh, a talk called RLLVM, and uh, I guess most of you understand what it is about. It's uh, a project aiming to provide multiple backends for the high performance uh, Erlang compiler, the Hype compiler, that uh, nowadays, or actually for many years now, has been uh, part of OT Erlang OTP. I hope you're using it. Uh, using the low level virtual machine infrastructure uh, for building compilers uh, that uh, is uh, very hype with uh, why this time these days. Uh, in order to improve the performance of Erlang applications, but more importantly, to ease the maintenance of its native code compiler. So we're going to be using the LLVM, the low level virtual machine, as um, something that will hopefully substitute all the um, backends that the Hype compiler currently has. So you might ask yourselves, why do that sort of thing? Why create an LVM? It's a very good question. Um, I actually started uh, work on this, or the students actually started work on this slightly before the uh, last year at Erlang Factory. I actually talked to some people that are sitting in the audience about that thing. Uh, but uh, immediately a bit after the Erlang factory, uh, there was uh, this thing, uh, this video by Yuri, um, which uh, I hope you have seen, but just in case you have not seen it, I will play it for you. It's hilarious. It's really nice. Um, The answer is now yes to this question. Yeah. Try a language that works better in the benchmark game. I want to support 800,000 simultaneous connections from my netbook, and I heard Erlang do this. <laughs> this is not just about Erlang, but also about your machine and general architecture and whatnot. So you were saying Erlang cannot do it? <laughs> Maybe I should try Scala or Node.js. <laughs> Yeah. 
I think you get the message. It's hilarious. I recommend to everybody to see this if you have not seen it. Uh, actually, I really, whenever I want to uh, laugh again, I'm actually looking at this. I've seen it more than... Uh... <laughs> but uh, jokes aside, uh, let's see what, why we did that sort of thing and what can it uh, uh, give us. So this talk is about uh, the LLVM compiler. So I will do some overview first of the current hype native code compiler and uh, the LLVM info compiler infrastructure. Uh, then I will describe the architecture and implementation of LLVM. Uh, the extensions that we had to do to LLVM itself and uh, the new hype component that uh, we have added in the Erlang OTP system. Uh, then the moment you've all been waiting for, uh, what sort of performance we are getting this, uh, in, the, in this backend versus the BIM compiler uh, versus the original hype. And I will uh, uh, finish with uh, reviewing the current status of where we are and some future work, what we plan to do. So feel free to interrupt at any point, by the way. So Hype is the High Performance Erlang Compiler. It's actually a project that started in Uppsala University in 1997, perhaps early 19, uh, late 1996 or something like that. Uh, actually, before I joined Uppsala University, which happened in 1999, um, they, their aim was to develop a native code compiler for Erlang. And at that time, actually, there was not Beam around, but some other uh, abstract machine called Jam that some of you might have heard. And actually the first uh, native code compiler for Erlang was for that virtual machine. Um, pretty much when I joined the project, uh, it was the time that the jam was being phased out and the beam was the only virtual machine. So one of the things I, actually this is my probably the major contribution to the high compiler is to actually write the front end that translates from beam bytecode to uh, Hype's intermediate code representation. And since uh, 2001, it's integrated into Erlang OTP. You can use it. By now, it's a mature compiler, mature in the sense that it's very robust. But at the same time, we have all these years, we have been adding some optimizations here and there, some better register allocators, for example, uh, some uh, SSA con, uh, type optimizations, and so on. So it produces reasonably efficient code, uh, and we're going to see how it compares with LLVM at the end. And by now it has the following backends. It supports Spark V8 Plus. Um, uh, this was the original, uh, the first backend we had in Hype. Then we had an x86 and an x86-64 backend. A PowerPC, an ARM backend, and the latest one we had was a PowerPC 64. So if you take Erlang OTP, uh, you will get all these backends automatically uh, if you happen to have one of these um, uh, machines, arch architectures, and you uh, enable Hype. There are some architectures where Hype is not enabled by default. So, but uh, this was back uh, basically technology of the, 2000, of the beginning of the 2000s. Since then, there has been a lot of development in providing other uh, infrastructure for compiler writers. One of the more interesting ones the last few years has been the LLVM. It's a low level virtual machine. And actually, it's not really a virtual machine. It's a collection of industrial strength compiler technology, really. Um, it's a language independent optimizer and code generator for various platforms. It has a lot of optimizations already built in. It has many targets. It generates reasonably good code. Uh, it mainly targets, and this is something that they don't really say very loud, but it mainly targets uh, C, C++ and Objective-C. So it has been built with this type of languages in mind. It's designed for, for speed, reusability, uh, and compatibilities with some of the GCC quirks. It provides debuggers, binary utilities, standard libraries, a lot of low-level tools, and many advantages. Um, it's a 
It also provides a high-level portable LLVM assembly language, which has a RISC-like uh, uh, in instruction set, a static type system. Um, it uh, performs everything on static single assignment form. Um, and uh, the assembly, it, has, it comes in three forms, in a human readable assembly, uh, so that uh, uh, developers can actually debug this sort of thing. It comes in a form that is for on disk and a form for in memory. Now, um, why should one use LLVM? Actually, it's used as a static or a just-in-time compiler for, and for static analysis. It's a state-of-the-art software with a very active community right now. Um, it's a big community worldwide, um, and they are very active right now. If you want to build a new, com a new compiler, all you have to do is to put some glue code and possibly any components that are not available for the language that you want to uh, compile to. And it allows the choice of the right components for the job. For example, the register allocator, a scheduler, an optimizer, uh, how the optimization is going to happen, in what order, and so on. So this is actually quite flexible, and you can choose these sort of things. Uh, more importantly, it, uh, it supports a lot of architectures, many more than the hype compiler supports. So it, has, it supports, of course, x86 and x86-64. It supports ARM and various versions of ARM. Uh, PowerPC, Spark, so far we have all these things, but we don't have an alpha port in the Hype compiler, a MIPS port, a black fin, I don't even know what this is, uh, a cell uh, SPU, I don't think that anybody will be running Erlang on the cell, but anyway, who knows. Uh, and the other ones, you can read them yourself, this is not really, there are actually many more than this, these are just a selected few. Uh, it's an open source project, it comes with a BSD style license, and uh, currently it has many contributors, both from industry, uh, research groups that are working on compiler construction around the world, and various individuals. So it's a very active community, so we thought, okay, let's compile to that, and let's see if uh, actually we'll get some performance improvements. Now, before I describe how uh, the architecture of the Erl LVM compiler is, uh, let me describe how the architecture of the Hype compiler is. And this is a um, slide that I've been recy recycling from 2001 at least. Uh, so, on the one side, you have the Erlang runtime system. And the Erlang runtime system comes with a beam emulator or interpreter. Uh, which uh, produces, uh, the beam compiler produces some bytecode, and this bytecode is loaded and fed into the uh, bytecode emulator. There are some other data there, like for example, the binaries or all the data that you uh, load into the system. And uh, the compilation to native code happens as follows. There is something called the beam disassembler, it was actually my first Erlang program ever, believe it or not. Um, I, which takes the beam bytecode and compiles this to some symbolic representation, basically in Erlang terms, so that uh, 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 at this time there is no zeros and ones that the beam bytecode consists of, but it has a, a symbolic representation. This gets translated into I code, and at the level of I code, uh, this is the intermediate code uh, form of the uh, hype compiler, and at that level, there are various uh, high level optimizations that take place common sub expression elimination, constant propagation, that at the level which is very close to what the Erlang source looks like and has more or less Erlang semantics. Then, once all these optimizations are done, what happens is that we translate this to a register transfer language. So this is very, very much like um, a register transfer language that you find in GCC, for example, uh, where certain things become uh, explicit and uh, then various optimizations are happening again at that level. Nowadays, all, both the I code and the RTL 
are using static single assignment form for everything they do. And then depending on the architecture that we are uh, targeting, we are translating the RTL into uh, the corresponding architecture, Spark, x86, x86, x64, and so on. And then this code is fed into the hype loader and loaded into the Erlang runtime system. And at that time, uh, byte code and native code can happily coexist for the same module. Um, and um, uh, then there, is, will, there will be a, depending on how you use the hype compiler, there will be some translation, transition from the byte code to the native code. If you just use the loader, it will just stop the system as you uh, heard Patrick uh, describing and uh, the native code execution will start happening. Uh, so you will be running native code even uh, within the BIM uh, interpreter. So that's pretty much it, the, the architecture of this. The thing I want to stress is that the hype compiler already does a lot of optimizations at this level. So we wanted to, to capitalize on these optimizations uh, in LLVM also. And we actually take advantage of the fact that there are a lot of optimizations that are at the Erlang or higher level than LLVM. LLVM, as its name says, it's a low level uh, virtual machine. So um, what happens in these boxes here, in this uh, uh, target uh, specific uh, components of the hype compiler is basically actually not that much. The only really very nice thing that happens is we have paid a lot of attention to have very good register allocators. And we actually have five different register allocators uh, that one can choose from. Uh, but the best of all is something called iterated register coalescing. And actually, it's a very, very good register allocator. It's probably state of the art. But that's actually the only thing that is that, are, that we are really proud in the back end of the hype compiler. Then there are some other things uh, having to do with the frames, the stack frames that we generate. Uh, we have to check for whether there is stack overflow because uh, in Erlang you have to do that sort of thing. Set up the frame, uh, create something called stack descriptors that describe the entries in the frame to, uh, that describe these entries to the garbage collector so that the garbage collector can know which things to follow when it uh, collects uh, the heap. And we need to add some special code for tail calls because tail calls are very important. Actually, they're a required feature in Erlang. Um, so we have to do some magic there for tail calls that languages like C, for example, don't necessarily have to do. Uh, then we linearize the code, meaning that we put the instructions one after the other and the basic blocks after the other, and there is some assembly happening. Notice that at this level, there is nothing related to instruction scheduling, for example. We don't have any such pass at the, uh, at the backends that uh, the Hype compiler has. Uh, we only have a very good register allocator and some things that have to be done to preserve uh, the requirements of Erlang. Now, um, so why did we use the LLVM as a backend? The first uh, reason was out of curiosity. I wanted to see how it would perform. Now, jokes aside, it wasn't really the video that made me uh, work on uh, this. It was actually scientific curiosity. How good is LLVM? Also, I wanted, uh, I had two bright students and I wanted to give them some very nice diploma thesis work to do. Uh, so that was the primary reason. But besides the scientific part, there, are, well, there were some other actually advantages. I think in the long run, it's easier to maintain uh, than all the existing backends. Uh, we, if we do it right, we will have to maintain just one backend instead of the current six. This will be smaller size of the code. Uh, the code is actually pretty straightforward. Uh, and we basically outsource the implementation of all the backends to the LLVM guys. And of course, as they optimize their LLVM infrastructure, we are going to get the benefits from 
them doing that sort of thing. Also, hopefully, we're going to get more backends for free, more or less. Um, because currently, we don't really have the, the infrastructure or the, the technology, the, the machine, actually. We don't have machines. All these strange machines that you saw actually don't have them. But uh, we could get them immediately if we do the compilation to LLVM right. And hopefully also improve performance. Uh, as I said, outsource some target-related optimizations to the LLVM guys. As we saw, with the Hype compiler does not have an instruction scheduler. So we could get immediately an instruction scheduler if we compile to LLVM. So that's what we did. And the new architecture of, uh, of LLVM right now uh, looks pretty much like the previous one with the only addition of a new target backend for the Hype compiler that comes immediately after RTL. We translate to LLVM rather than necessarily trans or in addition or depending on the flag or that the one can use, uses in the compiler, we translate to LLVM uh, rather than the corresponding target backend. So that's exactly what's happening. And then we use exactly the same loader uh, to load this native code into the Erlang runtime system. Uh, so to do that sort of thing, we have to be ABI compatible. And the Hype compiler has chosen some ABI. And uh, we try to respect that when we uh, translate to LLVM. So what were the technical challenges? Uh, we had to add a new component that translates from RTL to LLVM assembly. Uh, this happens with a new module called Hype RTL to LLVM that takes Hype's RTL and creates a human readable LLVM assembly, some .ll files for those that have worked with LLVM. Then we, uh, and then we get all the other ones immediately, for free, so to say, from the LLVM infrastructure. We take the assembler that takes these LL files and produces LLVM bitcode. Uh, then there are various optimization passes, and you can specify the flag that you want, either one or two or, or three. And this pro takes this LLVM bitcode and produces an optimized LLVM bitcode. Um, this LLVM uh, bitcode is uh, uh, translated to native assembly. And uh, this happens totally automatically. So we don't the user does not really have to say anything. The user, the only thing that it says is, I want optimization level that or this or the other. And that's it. Uh, then we call the LLVM GCC which uh, takes this uh, native assembly file and produce a .o. And this .o, we uh, use the something called ELF64 uh, format. And uh, we extract the executable code and all the relocation symbols that we have to do, that, we, that need to be relocated, all the symbols that need to be relocated. So, Unfortunately, there are very subtle points in using the LLVM. One has to be uh, paying attention to the calling convention because in the uh, Erlang virtual machine, there are some special registers. For example, there is a register that uh, uh, points to the current process that is executing. Uh, and depending on the back end, we might be using the stack, the native stack pointer. Uh, the args and the return values have to be in particular places to respect the ABI. Um, we uh, choose other, uh, some of the uh, registers are colli save, some of the other registers are caller save, and the colli is the one that actually pops the arguments. Uh, we uh, need to have the explicit frame manager because we need to check for overflow. And uh, the LLVM backend does not really, is not really designed to be checking uh, that sort of thing. So we have to do some assembly prolog in the uh, code we generate, in the inline code we generate. And we have to give information about stack descriptors. 
And this is the very tricky part in LLVM, uh, providing information about stack descriptors because the LLVM infrastructure currently provides very, despite what is being claimed out there, this, it provides very little support for doing precise garbage collection. And this is an issue that uh, a lot, we are not the only one who have seen this. All the people that try to compile Java, for example, on LLVM have similar issues that they have to deal with. So to make the, the, the long story short, we needed to do some patches to the LLVM uh, code base. And uh, there are just three patches that have to be done, conceptually three. Uh, there is a custom colleague convention that we have to uh, uh, implement or declare, actually. There is a nice way of declaring calling conventions in LLVM. Um, we have to write a GC plugin, plugin uh, and write the GC information in the object file. And then we use this uh, ELF for format to parse the .auto file and extract this info. And we need uh, some function pass, fu pass over all the functions to emit custom prolog for doing the stack overflow checks. So on top of that, we have a new hype component uh, on top of the current main branch. So we do re very frequent rebases on the current R15B main branch. Really recently we were uh, having this on the R14 for those that are interested. But now since that uh, the R15 is pretty stable, we are rebasing on the R15. So the current status is that we have complete support for x86 and x86-64 machines. So if you are running on an x86 or x86-64, you can use LLVM without any problems, I think. Um, and we have support for accurate GC. And all this thing is happening in about 5,000 lines of code, which is actually pretty low, given that uh, about one-fourth of this is comments, uh, and uh, about one more third of this, of the remaining one, is uh, the stuff that have to be doing with parsing the .auto file and extracting the info in the ELF format. So the result is actually by now very robust. Uh, we have the uh, x86-64 backend since uh, November or so, late November perhaps, and the x86 for the last two months. Um, it's pretty robust and it's ready to use in production if you are interested in that sort of thing. Now, the question you have been waiting for what sort of performance do we have? <laughs> so I will present uh, uh, six slides of uh, performance. The first three are compared to B, and the second three are going to be compared to the current hype compiler. I wanted to also compare with Erjang, but uh, it's very complicated. Uh, it's not so robust, and it's very complicated to actually compare fairly the just-in-time compiler because it depends on how many, how, how you warm up the just-in-time compiler. So I will only present a comparison with Beam and with Hype. So the first thing, the first uh, um, slide is this one, and I can tell you how to read this. Uh, these are uh, times compared to Beam being one. So they show speed ups. So for example, the Barnes program on the AMD64 or x86-64 is uh, about four times faster than Beam. And on x86 is 3.7 or 8, whatever it is, times faster than Beam. So you will see that pretty much everywhere, uh, the LLVM compiler is faster than Beam. The only case is this nrev benchmark, which basically executes append, and append is in C, in beam, so that's why it's actually uh, slower. Ah, the other one is ring, which uh, just exercises the scheduler. It doesn't really do anything interesting. 
the good side is the, the Erlang OTP scheduler. But you see that overall, the average here, the last line, we have speed ups that range from two and a half to three times. Pretty much this is the average. These are small benchmarks, uh, just benchmarks. Okay. The next set of benchmarks is from the uh, language shootout game that many of you might have seen at some point. These are all the benchmarks in the shootout, and actually these are the concurrent ones. So they are on a quad core, um, so they run in, they, they execute in parallel. And again, we see the speed ups that we have compared to BIM. Uh, again, they are anywhere from uh, a bit of a bit percent. Kamenaeus Redux is the only one that is a bit slower on AMD64 than BIM. For some reason, I don't know why. Uh, but there are benchmarks like this Mandelbrot on the x86, which uh, execute about eight times faster. And the last slide is uh, some other benchmarks to test particular things like tail calls and uh, binary thingies um, and uh, floating point manipulation. Uh, again, we have speed ups over beam that range from uh, two, two and a half to sometimes six or seven times faster. Yes. So there are two there are, there are two things here. There is beam running on 64 bits on the blue lines, and beam running on 32 bits on the green line. So there are two targets: one that is a 64-bit machine, and one that is a. Uh, so the baseline is the beam running on for the blue parts on 64 and for the green parts on 32. That's for one core, one processor? No, no, uh, well, uh, in this one, it's actually one processor. Yeah, so for in the previous one that was a shootout, okay. uh, this one, mm -hmm. they are on four cores. And it's the overall time to execute these benchmarks on four cores. Uh, the first slide and the third slide in this set are uh, sequential programs. Uh, this one is our concurrent program, the, the middle one. So you will see that overall there is, a, I don't know, two to three times speed up you can, on the average you can expect. Yes? On uh, OS native. Yeah, so what are the figures when you run through VMs itself? I have no idea. A lot of VMs are most of the No idea. We don't run on VMs. The only VM I run is uh, uh, whenever I want to use Windows. <laughs> um, so seriously, but uh, but it's a good it's a good suggestion. We'll run this. Uh, if you have some suggestion which VM to use, uh, the only VM that we have uh, is uh, uh, a Zen server, basically, something like that. Are people are using, using anything else or, yeah? I don't really know uh, why it's like that. Um, sorry? Particularly Mandelbrot, which is basically 15 bits. Yes. Floating point that one. So I suspect that perhaps the LLVM is using uh, more aggressively SSC2 or uh, uh, various hardware things that exist on modern x86s, but. Uh, they don't necessarily, the hype compiler doesn't necessarily take into account because it's designed to work on the lowest common denominator, so to say. 
while the LLVM can uh, probably do some more fancy things depending on. Yes? Do you have any numbers for the code size? The code size seems to be pretty much, pretty similar to what the hype compiler is uh, generating, which is about two and a half times, two to two and a half times bigger than BIM. Now, compared to the hype compiler, how does the LLVM fare? And these are the numbers. So again, the hype compiler here is one. And above the line, it means that the LLVM is, the LLVM is slightly better. Below the line, it means that it's slightly uh, worse. So pretty much it's about the same speed. Not quite in all the cases. In some cases, especially on AMD64, it seems to be uh, better than what the Hive compiler generates. But still, the differences are very, very, very small in either direction. So this says that we have done a pretty good job in the Hive compiler, which is a mature compiler by now. Um, on the other hand, we are sharing a lot of common things. So all the optimization that happened at the I-code and at the RTL level are, are common for both compilers, which I think is a good thing. But So that was the, that were the small benchmarks. In the shootout, it's very much, much better, actually, unif uh, be, be, with the only exception being Kamenez Redux, that I don't really know what's happening. And in the one case, it's... A, uh, what is it, about 10% slower, and the other case about 42% faster. I, I don't know why, why this happens. Um, but overall, it's pretty much the same uh, performance that you get with a hype compiler. And the last one is actually even more uniform. Uh, these are, of course, very small benchmarks, and they test particular aspects of uh, the, the implementation. Yeah? Is there any difference in the uh, step or process follow-up between the hype and the LLVM? Um, it's a very small benchmark. Is there any overhead in the prologue? Or there is an overhead in the prologue. There is uh, in LLVM, uh, which is slightly more because the LLVM does not have proper support for this. So, uh, so this can can be seen in in TAC actually, which is a very recursive program. Uh, not so much here actually, but sometimes we notice that actually there is some more overhead in LLVM than in Hype. How much time do I have? Uh, about 10 minutes. So I can probably do a demo. It's not very impressive, but you can just see that uh, how one uses the system and what sort of speed ups does one, uh, one gets. So so I have here um, this sort this some benchmark actually we got it from uh, the Hiriot Bath University uh, it's actually something that's about a thousand lines of code so you can just use the uh, compiler by um, pressing uh, by uh, putting plus native and uh, a new option to the hype compiler to LLVM or you can hard code this to LLVM one and you just need to write plus native. Uh, and uh, I can do the bench. You will see four rows coming out. The, f the first and the third are the result of the, uh, what the, this benchmark is computing. And the second and the fourth are what you will get by timer TC 
So these are the times that it takes. It's about 11, uh, if I have it right, it's about 11 million for the sequential execution of this and uh, 4 uh, million for the parallel execution of the same benchmark. This is on a quad core uh, that I have here. So I can make clean and edit the make file to take out the plus native from here and then I can do a make again. So that makes the things without uh, native code and now I can run the benchmark uh, in beam and uh, what sort of times do you expect as we're waiting? Three times longer. Any other takers? We're going to wait and see. Yeah. Right, Haskell does something totally, totally different. Oh, okay. Because in Haskell, the implementation technology is different. Um, it uh, has thunks which get put on the heap and it has totally different needs for uh, garbage collection than the hype compiler has. So this is about 56 million. So it's about 11, uh, five times better in this particular benchmark. And let's see the parallel one, how much it takes. Uh, it takes about 13 million compared to the four one there. Um, so now So that's where we are. Um, the last my last two slides pretty much is a recap of what hap has happened. The, these are the good things about what we have done. We have <coughs> a complete, and I think it's a very robust implementation. It can self-compile itself to native code and execute everything in the test suite of OTP. Uh, I think it handles all Erlang programs, but you can try your favorite ones if you want. Uh, it's ABI compatible with the Hype compiler. So you can smoothly, I've not tried this, but I'm pretty sure that it will work very well. You can, uh, uh, the, the integration with Beam works very, very well, but you can choose to compile some things with a Hype compiler and some other things with the LLVM. Uh, the performance is much better than Beam and almost as good as Hype. Not there yet, but uh, the, the difference is pretty small. Um, it's a much smaller and simpler code base for the backends. Uh, so if this really works, we're going to probably uh, substitute all the hype backend with this one. Uh, it gives us the possibility to target some more architectures than what hype currently supports. Uh, and most, more importantly, whatever LLVM backend improvements happen, now will also improve the performance of Erlang applications. Of course, also all the pessimizations that the LVM has will, that will degrade the performance of Erlang applications too. That's what you lose control when you do this sort of thing. Uh, there are some bad things about it. Uh, you need to download and install a custom LVM. The, the differences are actually pretty small. There are very few lines that we have to, we have added or changed. But unfortunately, for the time being, uh, you cannot get the LLVM that is the official one, although we rebase very frequently and get uh, all the updates and it seems to be working. It doesn't, our changes are pretty independent than uh, uh, what the main LL LLVM development is. Uh, there are slightly longer compilation times, basically because we are writing to files, these intermediate results. 
but they don't seem to be problematic, as you saw in the demo. Uh, we are trying to see if we can use uh, some Erlang LLVM bindings, but there are some issues there currently. So the future work is we are, going to, we are trying to push the LLVM patches upstream so that you don't have to download and install our own LLVM. And we are working on an ARM backend right now. And we try to improve the GC support. This is a generic issue in LLVM. It's not really related only to height, to, to Erlang. Uh, there is a site. Um, I will have the next slide. It will be more visible. Uh, where you can read uh, about the installation guide and uh, some other things. Uh, and uh, we welcome users. Uh, the site is this one. There are instructions on how to download and install the custom LLVM and the LLVM system. Uh, I strongly encourage anybody who is interested to test and measure. Don't take my word for it. Try your own benchmarks. And if you notice something interesting, just send them to us so that we look at them also. Uh, report experiences. We're going to set up a mailing list for those that are interested. But you, of course, the Erlang questions mailing list can also be used for that. And contribute to the project in any way you see fit, either by uh, improving some aspect of the code generation, if you happen to uh, have the time to do that sort of thing, and uh, you're passionate about compiler technology, uh, or by you can contribute by giving us some exotic machine, because we are only having x86 and x86 64s to test things, um, or in some other way that you see fit. That's it. <laughs> yeah, Tony. Yes. In Greece these days, we have plenty of time. It's money that is the problem. OK. <laughs> this is a very interesting question. So we have, for about a year now, uh, I, we have a complete set of patches, I think a complete set of patches, that unloads the native code. And the OTP uh, folks have been pretty busy, and they have not integrated that. But we, in principle, we have that. But uh, I don't, uh, by now, it's really not on the top of my priority list. But if, you, if uh, somebody is interested to try it out, there is on GitHub a set of patches that unloads the code. But we, in principle, we have that. Yeah. So um, the, they want to do. I don't. I don't want to. I, I don't want to suggest that uh, there's something wrong in the OTP team. They want to do it right, and they want to actually rewrite the whole uh, loader all in C. But um, this is a much bigger project. I was. I'm always of the opinion. Let's improve the situation rather than doing it the perfect way and wait uh, three years to do it until a developer uh, finds time to do it in the pre perfect way. Yes? Uh, what is the differences between the different optimization levels like Erl, Erl, or LLVM gives you? Does it make any difference? I don't, I don't know this. I've been swamped with uh, doing other things, and I have not tested that. So the default we are using is O2 here. Perhaps with all three magic things happen. We should have tested that, but. Yes? It's very difficult. It's this register allocator is written completely in Erlang. It uses a lot of magic stuff. It's, it's not so easy to do that sort of thing. 
Yes. We actually had started working on this, and it was almost working. We had some issue with funds, because funds were, the, the, the beam loader was doing some really mucho magic with funds when they were um, loaded. And uh, sometimes they were, this, the magic that we did and the magic that they did were not exactly the same. But uh, in principle, we have, already in the system, a translator from Core Erlang to uh, the I-code representation of the Hype compiler. So, yeah, that's but it's, there are some issues in the, in the loader. We are using the native stack pointer in some architectures on the Hype uh, compiler anyway. And I, w I, I, would s I don't know the answer to this question, but I would suspect that the LLVM is clever enough to use that. Well, At least on the x86, it should be doing that. I'll, I'll check it out, and uh, if you send me a mail, I'll, you'll get the answer in a mail. So thanks a lot, guys. <laughs>